Hey, are you a business owner, entrepreneur, or professional? If so, we want you to apply to be a featured guest on our show. My name is Adam Torres, and I host the Mission Matters series of podcasts. I've recorded over 3,000 episodes, and we are just getting started. How do you know if you'd be a good guest to be on the show? Well, only one way to find out, and that's to apply, but I'm going to let you in on a little secret. We want guests that have a story to tell, guests with a brand, a product, or a service that can benefit my audience of listeners. If this sounds like you, go to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. I'd love to talk to you and get to know more about your story. Again, head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. All right, now let's get into the show. Welcome, everyone, to another segment in our weekly episode that we put together. Today's topic is who is your role model and what have you learned from them? And what we put together is every single week we put together these weekly episodes. We change up the topics. It's always every Thursday at 4 p.m. PST, 7 p.m. for all you East Coasters. And I guess if you're in another part of the country, we'll just check the time zone. <laughs> but beyond that, we are Mission Matters. Uh, we're a multimedia platform focused on the needs of entrepreneurs, business owners, executives. Our mission, in short, is to help amplify their purpose. And the way that we go about doing that is through podcast content. We've recorded over 4,000 podcast episodes since, since we really started taking this off. We have a whole book publishing division. We published over 150 authors, and we always get several of our authors to join us on these uh, weekly calls. And uh, so really what we want to do is continue to drive, drive audiences to help inspire, educate them to become entrepreneurs or even better executives, you know, wherever they're working. And with that, I'll kick it off to Adam, and maybe we could have everyone do a brief introduction and uh, take it from there. Yeah, thank you, Shirag, as always. And let's just go around. So Jasmine, if you want to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you. We'll start with ladies first. <laughs> yeah, of course. So I actually initially got, and tell me if you can't hear me, I'm not sure to everyone else here that I um, decided to take myself out on a date tonight. So I'm working at a restaurant instead of a typical coffee shop. But nonetheless, so my name is Jasmine. I actually got introduced to Mission Matters through Michelle Mickey, who is one of the writers in the book. Um, Michelle is actually someone, funny enough, that I would love to talk about, but nonetheless, we were connected a couple of years ago, and Michelle has mentored me as someone in the digital marketing world for the last couple of years, and especially with having a startup agency. More about that later, but that is essentially me and a little bit about who I am. I'm in the digital marketing world. My adventure of entrepreneurship has come a long way. My background is actually in nonprofit development, so fundraising and marketing for about four years, and then decided to kind of take that endeavor on my own. And it's been a fun now almost two years of doing this. So that's me. Oh, that's awesome. And we love Michelle. And I, now I look closer at your picture. It says Chi Town. So you're Chicago too. That's awesome. Midwest, Midwest on Clubhouse tonight. <laughs> oh, yes. Definitely a uh, diehard Chicago lover. And strangely enough, I think us Chicagoans are notorious for having that characteristic, but that's also new. I've, I've not been a fan of Chicago for a long time, actually. I've, I've tried to move out any opportunity I could and it moved many different places but somehow it always brings me back so let's just embrace it cheers to Chicago <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> let's go Brian if you want to do your intro please tell us a little bit about yourself sure and again my name is Brian Patrick again a founder of Greenlight Startup uh, where we assist startups and investors to meet together and evaluate who, who can who is best matched up based upon risk profiling organizational maturity we're trying to we're trying to become the next fair isaac only specifically for startups so obviously I was, i'm one of the authors in the, in the in volume four mission matters like i said it's been wonderful working with adam and shrog and everybody here and and and, and networking people one of the things which i don't normally mention that i have done you know as i've you know, gone through my career working at startups, then larger companies, large, you know, big banks, big four, and then back to, you know, back into the startup space, only this time with my own firm and helping other firms and other founders to, to grow and to, you know, to scale out. One thing I don't, that I don't typically mention, Adam, at, the, at these events is that I also, for about four years, I served on the, the XPRIZE Foundation. 
which is you, you most of you probably have seen this the most famous one is the spacex one but they, they have tons of other ai specific competitions that they're, they're usually multi-year competitions and i served as one of the startup mentors because each entry is typically a startup company that has you know a, you know a vibrant new idea a lot of these ideas are specific to solving a human-based problem everything from climate change to how to use ai in a socially acceptable uh, and mutually beneficial way for human society. And there's a ton of stuff. If you ever see, if you just go X Prize, you can see. So I had to mention that that's something, you know, I do that as a volunteer and it's, it's very proud work. This one, I implore everybody to see what they've been doing. And if you are an entrepreneur or if you want to help others that are in that space, there are some amazing, astonishingly great people, far greater than myself. <laughs> and I would, I, would, I would ask and implore you actually to take a look and see what they're working on because it, it will blow your mind. It will literally blow your mind. They're changing the world over there. So, Awesome, Brian. Thank you. And uh, Rock, on to your intro, please. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, hi, Tim. Thanks for that. So I work with Mission Matters as a brand. Um, I work as a senior publishing consultant here, so as a sales manager. Um, we were small. Our team is pretty small at the moment, but I guess me and Chicago, we're slowly getting there. But I guess we're growing to a point where I can manage a lot more people and help the, the team overall. I've done extensive sales work before. And so I decided to work with Chirag and um, Adam because we get, sometimes we get some really, really important people that I speak to and I enjoyed that, that process more than, uh, yeah, than anything else really. But yeah, that was my intro. All right. So today's topic is pretty straightforward and I got some, and I'm really interested to see what everybody says. So I guess the, the basic is, you know, who, who's your role model? And I guess I'd say I'd start before the, like what you've learned. I just say like, and kind of why, like, so who, who wants, I'm going to open up the floor on that one. And, and like, who wants to get us kicked off on, on who's your role model and why? And don't everybody jump in at one time. Come on now. I'll call people. I'm not scared. Do I have to start? Okay. Do it. Get right, in there, Brian. I'll, 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 I'll get in there. Okay. I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention way, way back, and I'm dating myself again. Going back to late 80s, there was, and still is, an amazing uh, female entrepreneur named Ruth Stanett. She's published about four, roughly about four or five books, starting with The Intelligent Corporation. So again, when I say late 80s, she was, she was talking about the European... It was the EC before it became, you know, before it returned to the European Union. The EC failed and then they kind of rebranded it, right? And now it's good. But she was talking about how U.S. businesses have to do better market research and, you know, internationally. And she was basically doing a news clipping service that she turned into a market research company. And I was an intern there just basically doing clip, you know, news clipping services, picking up articles, news abstracts. And then I, I would write up a few ab abstracts. But Ruth Stanett, she's if you met her, you would understand why I say that she is a dynamo. She does not understand what the word no is or the word can't. She literally, you know, for, for her double master's degree from, from NYU, she has no knowledge of what those two words mean. And I learned that someone who is under, who's barely five foot tall, you can look up to them physically as well as, you know, as well as metaphorically, because she, I, what I learned from her or what I got from her is the idea that you, you know, you don't have to accept things as they are. And no matter what, where you're starting from, in my case, I was just a kid, you know, I was still in college trying to figure out what I wanted to do uh, with my life. I wasn't even old enough to drink yet. I was still under 21, but I still remember and we stayed in contact. The thing I think that stayed with me from her was the tenacity, the indomitable, uh, indomitable spirit of someone who understood in the late 80s, it was still difficult for a, for a female entrepreneur to be taken seriously in the US. She was flying into Europe to sell market research to establish, you know, to very, you know, austere companies that, you know, pharmaceutical companies, you know, consumer brands, companies, banks, and other manufacturers. But she was fearless, still is. She's in her 70s and she still runs the company. And she's changed it. She, another thing that I got from her is not just to be indomitable, but to be highly adaptive because she's been able to change and rebrand the company and the services and the products so quickly on a dime and run her operation ultra light when she had to, when money was when money's tight, and then scale out and branch out and not be afraid to make the tough to make the tough calls and the tough decisions. So again, every, when I whenever I speak to her every year, I usually go, you know, she invites us over her home. She owns a co uh, condo over in uh, right right across the UN Plaza. And every time when we go for holiday dinners and we see the crowds of people that talk to her, they're amazed at the fact that time has not slowed her down. 
And I would hope that for all of us, no matter as we break into our 70s, to still be entrepreneurs and to still have the passion. If she can do it at 70 or turning 71, there's no reason why all of us should be, you know, leaping out of bed every day, uh, ready to ready to, you know, just grab the world, so to speak. So I think you can understand that's why she's, she's been my role model for like over 30 years. Man, that's awesome. What a story. And everybody did and this. Is, so, hey, this isn't an interview for everyone. Like this is jump in. This is a dialogue. Who else wants to share? That's great, Brian. I appreciate it. And John, I, I don't think uh, we got an intro from you. If you want to maybe introduce yourself to the group. Hi, Marshall. There you go, sir. Yes. Hi, Adam. How are you? Good to see you. Oh, or oh, hear you, hear you. <laughs> Hear you. By the way, everybody, just so you know, John is one of my, he's becoming one of my closest friends. So thank you, John, for joining. I just had to give you a shout out there, okay? Yeah, no problem. I'm not that savvy with uh, a lot of the platforms and social media, so I apologize. My kids would be here to teach me all of this, but I'm on my own today. So nice to meet everybody, first of all, and I'm very eager to continue and engage in dialogue, professional dialogue as we go forward. So hopefully you'll see more of me. I'll echo Brian's note. Brian and I share a lot of philosophies when it comes to, you know, the hard work ahead of us and trying to make sure that there is some sense of equity, or at least we're breaking down those underlying attractors that have been around for so long. And it is not a short-term exercise, as we know. So a lot of diligence and smart people, uh, namely Brian, which is why I've stayed so close to him and some of the innovative thinking and work that we've done together and the support I've had. So I got to give Brian a shout out. He's uh, pulled me out of the trenches a couple of times over the years, which personally and professionally, which I appreciate. So enough of the commercial on Brian. Role model as the topic. I, you know, I was thinking about this as I first joined, I was listening and it kind of dawned on me to be very genuine. I, I don't know that I have a top list of, of people that, you know, I've looked up to. I think we're covering a lot of new ground as we go forward in this day and age with, the transparency and the societal issues that we're all seeing right in front of us. So I'm not sure other than the pain that others have suffered to try to find a level playing field, it's, it's kind of hard to, to see who's achieved success. However, I would kind of yield to one of my old uh, bosses. I was at McGraw Hill for a number of years, 18 years, 19 years. And I've had, at that time, I think I had seven or eight different bosses. I was on the executive team of S&P for a while. And my boss was a young woman named Victoria Powell. She was the CEO of the commodity division. And she brought me back from the education sector out in California to come work in New York again as, uh, I think, a vice president of project something. But I ended up as the CIO of that group for about seven years. And she is somebody who is still my mentor today. She's in Switzerland. I talk to her at least once a month. And as a minority and as a woman leading in, in corporate America today, I literally just kind of shoulder to shoulder watched, you know, right by her side, watched her walk through some of the, the challenges being a woman in corporate America today and dealing with those environments. And I think that I look to her pretty regularly when it comes to figuring out how to methodically think through my next steps or a decision and try to pull the emotion out of it. As a personal friend, you always bring emotion into the conversation, but she has a way of kind of thinking long term and making sure that everybody around her, you know, in that might be impacted by a business decision are considered. In many cases, uh, it's not a pleasant outcome for them, but she looks at things from every single angle and considers everybody involved. It's also helped me figure out how to make decisions that are very, very uncomfortable, particularly, again, business decisions where you know you're stepping. If you go right, you're going to step into a lot of challenges and issues you don't feel like you're ready for. But if you try to avoid it, you know, the challenges and issues you face are just as painful. So I think she's given me the courage to kind of keep putting one foot in front of the other and you know, whatever the footwork is that's necessary to move forward, I got to kind of man up and just kind of start moving in that direction. I've seen her do that as, again, as a woman and some very difficult challenges with, with Terry McGraw and others uh, over the years. And I just get a lot of encouragement from, from that kind of leadership, you know, because I, I, and I'll leave you with this. I think that in my situations, I try to create a shared image of a desired future. So those who are around me, 
if I can get everybody on the same page or, or work, do my part to get everybody to see that future that we're striving for, then I think decision making becomes a lot clearer, right? Uh, again, the outcome is not pleasant for everybody, myself included, but if we can paint that shared image of a desired future, call it equi uh, equity or diversity and inclusion, if we're all kind of shooting for that same goal, then you don't have to worry about the day-to-day -day grind so much. You know, it's just, if you're trusting those people around you, I think you'll ultimately end up close to that goal. But that's probably about as close of a role model as I have, but I'm certainly going to give it more thought because I've really never considered it in this context. So Adam, you asked for it. I can run my mouth until you shut me up. So I'm going to shut myself up now. That sounds like a role model to me, John. What do you mean? Like, how does that not qualify? Did you just hear yourself? You're going to have to listen to the playback when we post this. Sounds like a role model to me. As much of a friend as anything. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Jasmine Rock, come on. Tell me who those role models are. Who wants to go first? Come on. I know you got somebody who's in who's influenced you. If we don't like the word role model, I don't know. Maybe that's a maybe that's an antiquated term that we don't associate with quite as much, or I don't know. Um, no, not at all. I think the word role model for me, role model mentor, whichever. I think they're interchangeable. But I sort of prefaced this earlier, and you know, Michelle Mackey has really had an impact on my life and my ability to number one come into this space when I was. And I don't know what better word to use really than just novice, right? I think my background, as I mentioned, I initially was in education. So I was a high school biology teacher for some years and decided to transition out of that and had mentors in that space, but transitioned out of that because of my love for nonprofits and really working towards a mission. We talked about Chicago earlier, but really eradicating homelessness in Chicago. And so I'm sure now you're wondering, okay, well, how the heck did you get in marketing then? But the organization I was working for being in the development space, so fundraising and marketing really brought out this marketing passion. And so when I learned this about myself, this being very new to me and this transition of a career that I almost felt I shouldn't do because of my background in the sciences and education, I encountered Michelle and she was really able to pull me out of a space where oftentimes when I encountered, when I, when I was in a space of maybe ambiguity or really questioning, you know, how do I develop myself professionally? And I want to learn more about marketing, not only in a nonprofit realm, but corporate. Also business to business marketing, right? My The depth of my knowledge at that point was really social media management. So she has not only shown me resources for me to reflect on, but really has taught me the way of entrepreneurship because that's really what brought me to this space. It was, it was more than just marketing, but really being able to take the skills that I had learned in the nonprofit world, my passion for missions, and then my wanting of trying to develop something that would be my own. And I mean, her story, if you guys don't know Michelle, and I know obviously everyone here has read Mission Matters, but her story is just phenomenal. And being someone who has been in the realm of PR for so many years and a cancer survivor and a mother, and I mean, she's absolutely dynamic. And my appreciation for her and everything that she has taught me from things even like imposter syndrome, right? I think as a woman in not only in this space, but having gone to school in Iowa and initially being from Chicago, something that I encountered for a bit and she was able to through, but also, you know, to discuss, become truly the best version of myself and really how do I scale a business, right? And I think it's brought me to a space where I started with the agency um, about a year and a half ago, just under two years. And from the moment that I started and then now where we're at, you know, I've been able to double our revenue. I've been able to bring in a multitude of clients under six months. My first six months I had brought in about 10 new clients and so for me it's not so much to say you know look at everything I've done but rather look at what we can accomplish when we have people who are truly guiding us and sharing their own personal testimonies to really not only believe in ourselves but really dig into the deepest I would say like the depths of, of our brain <laughs> that sometimes are not tapped into when I do I give my credit to, to her and I also have another mentor that I won't you know, I don't want to take too much time and I can, I'm happy to talk about her later, but 
I think these conversations are so essential. And I think even now it's inspired me to be in a space where I've had a mentee for the last couple of months that I've actually hired into our agency now that I'm partner. And it's for me, these conversations and these spaces and having mentors, it's really just about giving back and really just being able to, I want to say show the way, but really just share your experience and hopefully it'll inspire someone else. So yeah, that's my two cents on Michelle. Man, that's awesome. And you, you actually took it exactly where I was going and, your, and how you ended it. It's almost like we had this plan, Jasmine. But my next question was going to be, so we've all been, you know, influenced by role models or mentors, like, like how important is it for you to be one and to kind of think about it? So you, you brought up mentee. So to make, to carve out that time, like, like intentionally, right. To give back just the same way that, you know, people throughout your life have given back. Yeah, I think I, I missed that for a second. I don't know if that was specific to me, but I think my the only thing I want to add to that is I think when we have role models that, and you see how busy they are, right? I think for me, I was 22 right out of college and looking for someone to support me, but I was in a space where I'm, I'm just entering the professional world, right? So even the definition of busy and the definition of a schedule it's so hard to even wrap your mind around someone not having even 30 minutes or an hour to give to you. And now being in a space where, you know, I'm, I'm juggling 2000 things and I've been able to develop my career. I have so much more of an appreciation for everyone who has mentored me throughout my life, whether it's the education space and in, in the sciences, then transitioning to nonprofit and now marketing with Michelle. So seeing those examples and seeing the really it's just kindness like you no know, you ask people to be your mentor and it's out of the kindness of their hearts and their belief in you and they're wanting to see you grow and have a front seat to your success that it's now inspired me to really tell myself you know I should be doing this for someone else and I don't know to what impact I will have on their life but at least I can share my story and tell them what's worked and not worked for me and hopefully it will provide them some value. And if it doesn't, then, you know, more power to them. I hope that they find a mentor that they can match with, but it's really just like the, I don't know what other philosophical way to say it, but like the circle of life, or I think I talked about this in the last conversation, but like this philosophy of Ubuntu and humanity and like all of us being connected. So that's my perspective on sort of being a mentor now. It's an Anyone else care to comment on that or, or serve as a mentor or, or work with uh, mentees or anything of that nature? Just curious to hear that because, I mean, it, it can be tricky sometimes and I'm in the same boat like I tried to, but I haven't really done anything too formal around the lines of mentoring or things like that other than what we do kind of day to day. I could, yeah, if you'd like, Adam, if everybody could share one thing that happened. Uh, and this is, and actually, I wrote about it in my chapter in, in Mission Matters Volume 4, because it was just, I think, I think you're right, Adam. I think a lot of times it's not necessarily a formalized, we're going to meet on a one-on-one, -on -one and we're going to have an agenda, and we're going to discuss your progress through life and your life plans and such and such. That's perfectly fine to do that, but I think most of the time it's not like that. Most of the time it's a cup of coffee, and I'll use one. I'll just use one example. Uh, there's, a, there's a gentleman named Brian uh, Brian Nouse. I met him in 2017, so this is when I was still standing up Greenlight. I was still trying to figure out what is that? What is our value proposition? How do we? You know, how do we deliver service to these founders? And how do we make this work? How do we work with different types of different types of clients, founders, accelerators, venture capitalists, angel investors? Each one's a different customer. I was I was still trying to figure that part, and then I ran across him as a founder, but he was focusing on like basically like natural language processing and how you could use that to build websites. Which I thought was an interesting idea. You know, he came he came into the office. We we talked a little bit, and we just kind of met for coffee at a certain point. I met him also through because I was part of that X uh, part of the X Prize Foundation, so I was a mentor already. But those most of those mentorships and most of those uh, interactions were more online and maybe on the phone here and there. He happened to be in the New York area, so I just met with Brian. You know, we kind of talked. I introduced my brother, who was also helping me to set up the company, uh, the, the Greenlight Company. So we we just talked about what it's like and. And then I sort of just ask him basic questions like, what drives you? You know, what is it that makes each day important for you? And just those little conversations, little coffee talk. And then we kind of grew apart a little bit, you know, because he was kind of doing his thing. He was trying to focus on certain aspects. But ultimately, what I think happened indirectly, indirectly, is he reevaluated the direction that he wanted to go with his company. And 
instead of trying to focus on something that I even said, it seemed like you have a narrow beam in terms of what you're offering. And I think it's so much more that maybe you want to do, but you haven't gotten there yet. And I think some, I, again, I cannot take credit for whatever he accomplished. All I can say is between 2017 and 2018, just a year, maybe a little over a year, he entered into another IBM competition, what they call their call for code, which is basically doing things to help humanity. Not only did he enter it with a whole new business called Project Owl, which is basically mobile IoT for, for disaster recovery, you know, for natural disaster things, they won. They won a check for $200,000 <laughs> in less than 12 months. I don't know what it was I may have said or maybe something that I didn't say that may have in some way helped him to re, you know, to re-envision what he wanted to do. And I think it's beautiful. One of the last, you know, and I'll leave off with this. Something that got me very emotional. He was down in, in, in Puerto Rico back in 2019. I think, yeah, this is like right after. Because remember, when they, when they had Hurricane Maria. And he realized, not only can I deploy this for disaster recovery in the U.S., I can go someplace and test it there. He took his technology. They call it Duck, uh, Duck Link. And I'm just watching, and I'm, look, I'm looking at the video with him, and I'm seeing the same person who I had coffee and discussions with, but it's like, it's almost as if he grew up in, in, a, in a, it's almost like watching a child grow up, in a sense. I mean, he was, he was obviously an adult, but he became, he, he grew into himself, if that makes more sense. I feel like somehow there was a part of him, a voice that he didn't know how to express, and somehow he found the right team, he found the right thing, and it, he was walking, it, it showed pictures of him walking up and down the highway system of, of still ravaged Puerto Rico and how he was working with universities down there with IBM assisting, of course. But it showed him talking to the locals and saying, like, I wish we had had this technology. You know, there are people we know who had passed away. There are, there are whole communities and neighborhoods that, who could not communicate because the power lines were down. The mobile service was down. This is IoT mobile drones sent up with, you know, with a linking network. They call DuckLink, and each of the and that allows you with a, with a cell phone to connect to that if your mobile provider goes down. And by doing that, first responders, police, you know, fire, so on, hospitals, they can use that network to connect potentially to someone else to make a phone call to see is your mom and dad okay? Is your brother okay? Do you guys need anything over there? Do you need shipments of water? Do you need this? He, he just somehow, he created something not necessarily for that purpose, but based on the talk about when we used to sit down and just talk through coffee, what you, how you want to change the world, what do you want to do, how do you want to make things different, I don't know what it is that I may have said, or again, maybe something that I didn't mention, maybe, maybe the absence of something that I said, you know, created you know, something in his mind, because he totally changed his company around at some point after, the, after those conversations, and so sometimes I guess I'll end with this. Sometimes I think being a, being a mentor or a role model, you don't even realize the impact you have. But somehow, uh, to quote something from Senator Cory Booker, it's, almost, it's part of what I mentioned where what he mentions, sometimes we become cons- co-conspirators of love without even realizing it. And in some, in some manner, we, we help something to manifest that we had not seen, nor did the person that we were mentoring understand at the time. But something we said or did helped them get there. And that's... You know, that, that's the best part I, I think I can contribute with that. Yeah, that's awesome. And I mean, in, in my life, I just think about like mentors along the way or even role models. And I feel like every, as you get older and, you know, when you're younger, maybe you looked up to one person. And then as you get older, especially in business, so I can think about like some of my early um, business mentors, like, like when I was a teenager. Like I thought that maybe some of the, the the things they'd done, and I don't mean principles, I just mean like some, maybe even the industries they were in were interesting to me in that time. And then, you know, as I grew older and my interests change and maybe my scope or view of the world changes, for me, it was kind of like an evolution. Like who are my role models and kind of some of the things that, that I, that I sought people out to learn from and to learn like ideas and stuff like that. Like they kind of just change and evolve. Like right now, for example, I'm looking at, I'm looking for people that are like really experienced in media or people that have taken, you know, a certain type of media brand and done something that I'm like, wow, that was, that's amazing. How do they do that? How do I, and how do I get mentored by that, that individual or kind of what they're doing? And it's just to provide insight, just to kind of cut down that time of that amount of time it takes you to learn. I figure there's so many other people that have made the mistakes, right? If we can not make some of the same mistakes, then I mean, we're all, we're all better off. 
so that that's been my story with mentors. So I'm not I'm not just gonna pepper everybody else with questions and then not answer some too. So now that that's been my my feel and my experience, and it's still it's still evolving. But I think what was interesting on this call in general is just to see what everybody's take was and also you know their idea of mentor of being a a mentor or having mentees things like that so on my end i just wanted to that's the basic of the of what we wanted to cover is there anything anybody else wants to kind of throw out there in terms of like mentors mentorships any kind of stories they want to share kind of last words out there all right, then uh, is Shrag, you still on by any chance? Let's let uh, Shrag do his thing. Yeah, I am indeed. Thank you again for Wait a everyone. Minute. Hold on, hold oh. on, Shrag. You don't get off that easy. He always tries to get off so easy. You know you're going to ask me the question. You know I'm not letting you off the hook. Who's your mentor? You always made me curse on Clubhouse. Come on, man. Or tell me, answer one of these questions. He thinks he just gets to like moderate. Fair enough. Okay, so mine's is, uh, well, to start, there's several, but to start off, it's the parents and all the sacrifices that they made to, you know, firstly coming to the U.S., right, with pretty much like nothing and all based on the American dream, just because there weren't as many opportunities back then, right? I, and that, that was all part of it, right? In the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, even the 90s, right? I Probably even now, uh, a lot of people still believe in the American dream and uh, so wanting to explore that further. And so a lot of the sacrifices that they made to start off and a lot of the hard work ethics that I learned from them and then carrying it over to even like uh, I had a couple of professors at USC and then including the dean of my business school at USC and some of the things that he was able to create around him. He had a really strong halo effect. And the best example I share is that he ended up, he was, it's a long story, but he was forced to resign due to... I guess this is politics in short. And he had about like maybe several thousand people that signed a survey for him to reinstate him back as dean and like fought the institution. And I don't think anyone is expecting that much backlash because because of the amount of support that he had. And he never asked for it. Yeah, you know, he he had the and it was crazy because they offered him, I think it was like he had 600000 a year, uh, like $1.8 million left on his contract that he was supposed to get paid out. And they asked him, like, like, we'll pay you out, just leave quietly. But he didn't care about the money. He was doing it just because, like, he really enjoyed the job and position and to give back to students. And so I was actually a benefactor. Like, he had contributed some money to a couple of nonprofit stuff that I was doing, even back, back when I was at USC. And uh, he continued to support that program and along with many others that he directly impacted. So I want to give Dean Ellis a shout out for everything that he do. And then in regards to what I learned, I think it was more so creating the halo effect. Um, it was the impact that he had not only on my life, but I think a lot of others. And, uh, and so how do you create a community in short of, you know, people that are going to be, you know, friends, even during the good times and the bad. And, and so those are a lot of things that I was able to pick off, cherry pick off of him. I mean, I'm sure we all have a laundry list of others, but, you know, several, that, several books that come to mind uh, more immediately. And I think the bottom line is, you know, being able to solve problems and uh, keeping time for it. Like even right now, when I send him an email, as busy as he was, I had a response within like a day or two. So I, I never really understood how you do it, right? When you're responsible for, you know, when you're at that caliber, especially when you get a lot of people asking now you can close it down if you want to show it. Had to make it. Come on, man. Come on. Easy day. Thank you so much for uh, joining us on uh, tonight's uh, discussion on your role model. We always host, uh, again, these shows are weekly. And uh, in regards to next week, uh, or you know, if you're experiencing imposter syndrome, how do you deal with it? And uh, it's a common topic. I think that's come up quite a bit. I know. I think Ryan brought it up for a second. Um, and we, it's, I think it's come up in every conversation. But it's how do you overcome imposter syndrome and do you experience imposter syndrome? So it's uh, that discussion is going to be next week, Thursday, 4 p.m. PST, exact same time, same place. And, uh, and so, you know, stay tuned, though. We're going to have a lot more guests coming out to that one. Hopefully, a lot of people are back from Memorial Day weekend and aren't just taking the whole week off off of their vacation so i'm sure we're gonna get an amazing group coming in for that show as well so with that if there's no final comments you know let's looking forward to seeing you all next week all right same here yeah. looking Thank forward to it. everybody have a great memorial day too you too yeah. have a good Take care. Have a safe memorial day weekend.